All right, aloha kako, everyone. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions online from people uh, both on the Prusa forums and people in Ukraine as well about um, should they print the recent uh, hand splint STLs that and G codes that went up on the Prusa blog. And so I'm making this video to answer that. Uh, a little bit about me, I am a doctor of physical therapy and I treat hand injuries every day and I use a mix of 3D printing as well as traditional thermoforming with uh, a plastic called Aquaplast um, to make splints. So in this video, what we want to cover too um, is long-term applications of splinting. Um, Prusa did a great job of providing basic instructions um, on how to splint. Uh, those instructions were probably for short-term emergency purposes. What we want to talk a little bit more about is if someone's going to be in these splints for a longer period of time. So generally speaking, we like to splint things with the wrist higher than the forearm. And so I'm going to try to avoid using medical terminology. Um, and generally, we want the hand, if we're splinting the wrist, to be somewhat in this position. Um, if the wrist is splinted, flat or slightly down, um, it makes the hand very difficult to actually use, you know, for gripping, turning, twisting type tasks. Um, additionally, the biggest problem most people have with a broken wrist is getting their wrist to go like this, uh, you know, in the, the four to eight weeks after they break the wrist or, or have the surgery to repair it. The other problem a lot of people have is making a fist like that as well. Uh, so we always wanna keep that in mind that for most injuries, this is the position that we'll be splinting in. The big exception would be any kind of penetrating uh, wound, such as like a, a knife injury to the tendons. So if we had a laceration anywhere from forearm to fingertips, um, if we had to splint the wrist and the hand, a lot of times we will do it in this position. And the idea is to put a little bit of slack on the tendons, because if we are like this, like we just said, that could actually pull the two ends of the torn tendon away from each other. And so if someone has a deep laceration and you don't have the ability to you know, get it formally assessed, um, you should just assume that they have a torn tendon and splint them accordingly. Um, the other side to that is if someone has a penetrating wound on the backside of the hand or forearm, you would do the opposite. Um, let's say someone had a laceration here you know, glass or sharp, sharp object, uh, we would want the hand and wrist to be up like this, the fingers like that. So then we're back to that original position. So tendon injuries to this side of the arm, we want the wrist up. Tendon injuries to that side of the arm, we want the wrist down. Okay, so I wanted to give you all just a, a first-person view here. Uh, so in my clinic, we've got lots of fancy tools uh, to position a patient and to splint them. I didn't use any of those with any of these blue splints because I know that most of you all that have had questions about splinting are going to be making splints potentially outside of a, a hospital or medical setting. So first, I just wanted to show you, these are the splints that I typically make for patients. Um, we make them in the actual shape um, that they'll end up in. Uh, this was for a very, very small child that had a fractured wrist, what we call a distal radius fracture. I actually made this on an SLA printer off of a 3D scan of the patient. What I love about these splints is um, because they're printed flat, they're extremely easy for any printer to print. These are very, very difficult, especially on FDM to print without a lot of stringing and the need for a lot of post-processing. So these first two splints um, are really important because the most common injuries you're gonna see of the upper extremity are gonna be the distal radius fracture, um, which is this area right here, sometimes the ulna as well. But yeah, fractures right around this area are extremely common. They account for 20% of ER visits they're extremely common in conflict zones where people are running and tripping over things. So I made this actually over here on the stove. And just like we talked about in the last video, 
15 or so degrees of extension, so the knuckles are higher than the actual um, forearm there. That's extremely important. The other piece is you want the patient, if they're going to be in this for any period of time, to be able to touch their thumb to their fingertips. Um, if you can't get the pinky or the ring finger, that's okay. These two fingers are very important since we use these three fingers together a lot. The other piece is we want this below the ball of the hand. So we wouldn't want it up here like that where it would make the fingers hard to bend. We want the fingers to be able to bend fully. The biggest problem we see with these distal radius fractures is that um, people get stiffness in their fingers long term. They're not able to make a fist. A lot of them get stuck here and uh, causes a lot of long term disability. So the second splint, I was actually very surprised at how well it blocked flexion and extension of the wrist. Uh, really, really great. Same thing where we want the hand slightly up from the forearm and we want the ability of the fingers to touch. Um, really, really important. And then lastly, we want this to be below the knuckles. Another thing I did with this, it's probably hard to see on the camera. Sometimes when you bend the wrist up when it's still hot and you're shaping it, it can push this into the skin. And so I flared that out slightly so that when I bent the wrist up, it wouldn't just dig in. So that's really, really important as well. With the palm base splint, it was actually too big for me initially. So what I did is when I heated it up, um, I usually heat up PLA to about 80 degrees Celsius instead of 60 because it cools very, very quickly. Um, so I actually cut, cut it away. So you can see that way I've got the thumb clearance there. Can't quite get the pinky. And I actually took um, a mini blowtorch, a lighter would work too, and I kind of um, caramelized the top there because when I cut it initially, um, this was very kind of pokey. And so rather than sand it, I just went ahead and, and heated it up with a, a mini blowtorch. And here's the material that you can see I cut off here. So I really, really love this design here, the pinky splint. Uh, I'm using it a little bit differently from how Prusa had shown it. So the most common injury you're probably going to see other than the distal radius fractures, uh, something called a boxer's fracture commonly. Um, it's usually an offensive injury where someone's trying to protect themselves and maybe they, they punch something. You'll be able to tell if a patient has this injury because the knuckle here will look sunken. And so rather than splint it kind of mid hand, like the Prusa instructions, I actually moved it up a little bit. The boxer's fractures, we always splint the ring and pinky finger forward at an angle like this. So not curled, but from the knuckle, we want it to be forward. The reason for that is these tendons get very, very tight with a boxer's fracture. And a lot of times people have a hard time making a, a fist also. So splinting forward like that will prevent it, uh, usually at about 45 to 70 degrees. But obviously if you can't measure it, about halfway between here and there is where you want to be. And if the fracture is somewhere in here, uh, you want to make sure that they can still move their wrist. That'll prevent a lot of problems later. So as you can see in this design here, um, for my size hand at least, it clears the wrist. I wouldn't want it down lower to where it blocked the wrist from moving. People do sometimes get fractures here. It's less common than up here. But if you did have a fracture here, then more like what Prusa was showing initially, you would want to cover the fracture and you would want to stabilize the wrist. So you would want the splint to come down below the level of the wrist. So their finger splint that they put up, really cool design. Um, obviously fractures here are common like we talked about. They're also common here and here. Whenever someone is you know, punching or trying to defend themselves, so that's usually what brings people in. Uh, the way I splint that is just like this. If you can see that there. So in the textbook, 
They're splinted like this. However, I found most people really hate anything against their palm because the palm is so much more sensitive than the back side of the hand. So you could splint it like so. And then of course, just run your, your Velcro. Um, that goes for all of these. One thing I should touch on, um, I don't use a lot of that, um, a lot of wrap for the splints, like the cotton-based wraps. Um, most of my patients, unless they have you know very, very open wounds, we won't use any padding at all. Um, even if they have stitches where they've had a surgery, uh, we still leave it uncovered, no padding. The reason why, um, padding, especially as it gets hotter, can attract moisture, moisture can attract bacteria. And so if the skin is fairly intact, don't be afraid to just leave the limb, you know, completely unwrapped. Um, this splint here, also a really, really good splint. Um, you could use it a number of different ways, depending on the finger injury. Um, but fractures right here at the IP joint or middle, um, middle finger joint are pretty common. So you could use it um, all kinds of different ways, basically anything that you know, covers that joint. Okay, so before the video cut off, we were talking about the finger splints, but let's move on. Um, the last topic I wanted to cover is something called capillary refill. Um, we get a lot of questions about uh, how do I know if I've wrapped the hand too tightly in any bandage or if the splint is too tight. One way you can tell, you can squeeze the fingertip and see how it goes white and then back to pink very quickly. If you start to notice that changes um, after you've wrapped their hand or finger up and it takes maybe four or five seconds or it takes a lot longer than their uninjured hand, then you want to you know, unwrap the hand um, or wrap it lighter and check it again. So that's very, very important because if that capillary refill is really delayed, that could mean that you're cutting off circulation slightly.